you understand that this is a siege artillery. When you see these big wheels like this, that's, that's in the siege. siege class. Okay. They're just built heavier. And, uh... I'm gonna put my hand next to these cannonballs. What, are these 24 uh, pounds or more than 24 that, pounds? That's a 13-inch mortar shell. Okay. And yeah. where did, are these original or these are some from your manufacturing? From the Civil no, War? No, we, 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 we fired at, at Fort McCoy. We fired lots of, lots of uh, mortar rounds uh, downrange. Would these be explosive shell or just... Yeah, they're, all shell? mortars are shells. They all okay. explode in, in the air about treetop level. They, they're fused. See, when, they, when it leaves the bore, it's, it, it lights the fuse as it heads out. The rest is just a time fuse. This little field howitzer looks... Uh, this is a little pack howitzer. A pack howitzer? It's called a pack howitzer because you, you, you disassemble it on three mules. Yeah. Boy, yeah. what could seem uh, big by itself is get dwarfed by this larger equipment. I always think the pack howitzer is something that we went out west with. Sure, they had in the Civil War, but as far as I'm concerned, it didn't really determine any battle or anything like that. But it was handy out west because there was rugged, no roads. You, you were mm -hmm. forced to take something that you could pack. And now that the Indians, when you start firing the Indians, you were it was kind of a scare tactic. Mm hmm. Yeah. Bigger gun that you were yeah. accustomed to seeing. This is, a, this is the inside of Fort. It's called a flank defense hauser. Okay. And uh, <laughs> obsolete before the war started. And why was it obsolete? Uh, these were already installed in forts uh, to cover the molt yep. in front of the walls. Well, that was already obsolete because. The idea of molts. And so, so, they were not. They did, they did actually make some during the war to to finish some of the contracts, but they didn't use them for anything. But it's still a piece of history. Okay. And all of these guns down the row here are all Robert Parrott's guns, which of course, now I'm biased, Robert Parrott's my favorite cannon builder. Ah. And, and you, you may chuckle, but there's another reason. Besides being a true patriot, yes. when, the, when the war ended, he tore up his contracts. Uh, why is that? Or why would he tear up his contract? He don't need any more guns. Ah. He wasn't, it, it was him and only South Boston founder ever did that. The rest of them forced the government to buy all that obsolete stuff after the war. Yeah. But Some so. of it way up into the 1880s. They were still building it because he had contracts. Interesting. They so, must have had good lawyers or something. So he wasn't chasing the dollar. But that's right. Robert thought about the taxpayer. Interesting. Cost money. But then, of course, being an independent manufacturer, he had other things to manufacture. Same as the Phoenix Iron Company made the three-inch Ordnance rifle. Yep. The Ordnance rifle that was just a sub. That was just a contract that they made during the war. It wasn't. You know, everybody talks about Phoenix Iron Company as making the Ordnance rifle that's supposed to be something great, but it was just another job for them. So you mentioned the collecting, of course. Um, obviously, part of the collecting is the finding or the sourcing. Yeah. What sources do you use? I'm sure you made a lot of collect connections over the years. Yeah, connections. That, that's what you hit it right on the right word. It's connections. One person leads to another person to another person. And uh, I would like to say something about these two ordnance rifles. Let's hear it. These aren't just any ordnance rifle. Okay. All right. This ordnance rifle, number 141, and it was captured in the southern end of the Shenandoah Valley by uh, George Armstrong Custer, the youngest general that we had in the Civil War. Uh, and he listed it. There was four ordnance rifles in the group of guns that he captured from the Confederates, and uh, it was 141. Close up so of that. We got one that, that we got, yeah, that's in the official records, number 141. We fired a lot of rounds on that one. But here's one that's even, I think, even more interesting. This is our, this is our recent one. Okay, most recent This one. is the ordnance rifle number four. Oh, wow. So four, what's would, when would that be manufactured? That would be well, I mean, 50s? Uh, he, he man, uh, Phoenix Iron Company manufactured almost a thousand pieces. Mm -hmm. Almost. Well, number four, that's, that's one of the first ones that he made. And I know, I know where number one is. But another thing I thought was really interesting. This went through every battle, including Gettysburg, right to the end of the war. And the rifling still, it, it didn't crisp. But it isn't destroyed. It's mm. the same rifle goes all the way down to the bottom. Usually, on an ordnance rifle made out of wrought iron, birds make nests in there, and then they bring in mud 
mm -hmm. water gets in there, and then it, the wrought iron will erode. So we, we call it a bird bath. You go down about the trunk and you'll see a big cavity from nests that erodes away the wrought iron, so it ruins, it ruins the gun. See, like, that one there we have put. Yeah. Yeah, but they took very good care of it. A question for you, sir. Of all the artillery pieces in your, I should say, arsenal here, how many of these are, could be taken out to the range and shot today? Every one. Every single one. We don't have wall hangers anymore. We, everything here has to be and has been shooting.